and ordinary working people paid the price uh, for that. This budget will be a budget to fix the foundations of the economy after the mess left by the previous government, to rebuild Britain and to make working people better off. Alish MacDonald. Uh, number two, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have committed to deliver 1.5 million new homes as part of our mission to achieve economic growth across the country. We have already announced reforms to national planning policy that will help to get Britain building. This includes the reintroduction of mandatory housing targets and the removal of the effective ban on onshore wind in England. Ms MacDonald. Uh, thank, you. In, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In Norwich, Anglia Square is a significant brownfield site in my hon. Friend's constituency. The If One Lock could provide over 1,000 homes and many jobs. The previous government failed to support its, um, uh, its progression of this important site. Uh, can the Minister tell me what local councils like Norwich City Council can expect from this government uh, its approach to developing brownfield sites in, in, with partners? Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for her follow-up question and welcome her to her place. As she knows from the Chancellor and the Deputy Prime Minister, this Government takes very seriously our target to deliver 1.5 million new homes, and we will look at each and every opportunity across the country to do that. That includes making improvements to the system of developer contributions for community benefit to support the delivery of affordable housing and local infrastructure. Andrew George. The Minister f fully knows that the planning system is built on um, the back of the ability um, to make millionaires on the stroke of a pen as a result of passing planning permissions, that often is not necessarily that, that, that it results in developments which are in the best interests of, of a local community. Surely there's more that the government can do to ensure that we tip the planning system to, to meet need rather than greed. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The issue of so-called hope value was something referenced in uh, the Labour Party's manifesto, and the government will set out further detail in due course. John Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. With permission, I will answer this question together with questions 8 and 13. Investment is at the heart of this government's growth mission, alongside stability and reform. With robust fiscal rules and respect for economic institutions, the government is building the confidence needed to deliver private sector investment. It is vital also that the tax system supports growth, and that is why today I can confirm that at the Budget the Government will be outlining a tax roadmap for business to offer the certainty that encourages investment and gives business the confidence to grow, including our commitment to cap corporation tax at 25 per cent for the duration of this Parliament and to retain full expensing. John Warren. Um, um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Chancellor for that response. Um, last year, the North East attracted 67 foreign direct investment pro projects, creating over 4,000 jobs. In the key growth sectors, from advanced manufacturing to health and tech, those who know the North East know our huge potential, and I know that the Chancellor recognises that too. So what is she doing, together with our North East Mayor, Kim McGuinness, to ensure that more global investors are aware of the North East strengths and can, we can attract more inward investment, creating more jobs. Um, I thank my right hon. Friend for that question, and she makes an important contribution, both on behalf of her constituents, but also based on her background working in science and technology before entering uh, this House. Uh, my right hon. Friend is absolutely right that the North East has got huge potential uh, to grow the economy through sectors including advanced manufacturing, uh, health, technology, and also our creative industries. And this Government will work with our local mayors, including Kim McGuinness, uh, to develop those ambitious long-term local growth plans that reflect the North East's strengths and looks to address some of the barriers to growth and support delivery of our national industrial strategy, as well as narrowing some of the inequalities that have persisted for far too long. Alan Gamble. For the aviation and aerospace sectors, and aviation and aerospace is important for my constituents in Central Ayrshire, with 55% of aerospace jobs based in Prestwick. Can my right honourable friend tell me what more the government will do to ensure continued international investment in these sectors? I thank my honourable friend for that question, and I know that his experience as His Majesty's Trade Commissioner in India means that he understands the importance of global trade and investment uh, to the UK economy, including to the Scottish economy. 
Last week, I had the opportunity to visit the National Manufacturing Institute in Scotland and see firsthand the excellent work that is going on to promote innovation in a whole range of sectors, including aerospace uh, and satellite technology. The UK already produces around half of the world's large civil aircraft wings and engines, and the aerospace sector added £11 billion to the UK economy just last year. The Government is putting investment at the heart of our growth strategy, including supporting advanced manufacturing in Scotland, and I look forward to working with the Honourable Member on this endeavour. Uma Kermelan. Thank you, Mr Speaker, uh, and thank the Chancellor for her further reassurance to businesses this morning. Mr Speaker, London is the top choice in Europe for inward investment and is home to more headquarters than any other European city, including many based in Stratford in my constituency. How will the Government support our capital city to continue its success on the global stage and ensure that London can help uh, encourage onward investment and support wider economic growth around the country? Um, I thank my honourable friend for that question and welcome her to her place. The regeneration of Stratford after the Olympic Games uh, is truly phenomenal, and I know that the honourable uh, lady will be uh, a really strong voice for her constituency and help deliver the growth mission, which is the number one priority of this new government. The success of London's economy will be integral to delivering that mission, and we will work with the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, as well as our MPs, to deliver to ensure that economic growth benefits uh, people in the capital and across the country, uh, ensuring that we narrow the gap between rich and poor, but also showcase the huge opportunities that London has on the international uh, stage. And we'll be hosting an international investment summit in London on the 14th of October, bringing together some of the biggest global investors in the world to showcase everything that our great country has to offer. Jim Farrell. Speaker, investment in our rural economy must focus heavily on rewarding our farmers for the food they produce and for the environment that they protect. The last government uh, ring-fenced £2.4 billion a year for England to support our farming sector. Through indifference or incompetence, they underspent by £100 million last year and betrayed our farmers in doing so. Will she confirm to me, to my farmers and to this House, that she will not bake in that underspend that was the fault of the last Conservative Government and will commit to at least ring-fencing what is already invested in farming, and if not, hopefully back the Liberal Democrats' call to back a billion extra into farming so that we can feed our... Oh, 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 order! Order, order, Mr Farron, please don't take complete advantage. If you, I think it's slightly straight from the original question. If you want to have a go at it, by all means, but if you don't, I understand, Chancellor. The rural economy plays an incredibly important uh, role in our uh, economic prosperity as a country, and boosting food security and biodiversity is obviously incredibly important to a whole range of this government's objectives. Uh, I will ensure that the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs uh, hears loud and clear uh, the message from the Right Honourable Member, and will ensure that uh, I'm sure that he will include that as part of his submission to the Spending Review on the 30th of October. Jim thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Chancellor for that and uh, welcome her to her place? Uh, it's very important, to, obviously, to encourage inward investment. It's also important to, to address the issue of youth unemployment. As of the first quarter of 2024, the youth unemployment rate of Northern Ireland was 5%, compared with 3.8% on the month before. So, can I ask the, the, the Chancellor this question? What chance and discussions has the Chancellor had with the Northern Ireland Assembly Minister in charge to ensure that youth employment? Unemployment in Northern Ireland is reduced to a figure that is acceptable, and that should be zero. Thank you. <laughs> a huge amount of in, um, inward investment goes to Northern Ireland, as the honourable gentleman uh, uh, knows, and it is important that young people are able to take advantage of those huge opportunities in our economy, whether it is in financial services, advanced manufacturing, shipbuilding, and in so many other sectors that are important uh, to uh, Northern Ireland. It, it is a travesty that something like one in five young people today are, are not in employment or education or training. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions will be bringing forward a, a white paper to ensure that everybody can, who can work does work and are given the support to succeed, uh, both in Northern Ireland and right across the United Kingdom. No law. Question for Mr Speaker. Thank you. 
Uh, the government is already taking action to fix Britain's economic foundations and a new approach to growth with three pillars – stability, investment and reform. Sustainable public finances are necessary for economic stability and long-term growth, and the government will set out the difficult decisions needed to secure the public finances in the budget on 30th October. The government has already announced a fiscal look to support policy stability, ensuring that fiscally significant announcements are subject to an independent OBR assessment. Thank you, given the fiscal inheritance we've been left, the Chancellor has had to make some very difficult decisions to ensure that economic stability. Workers and pensioners just above the personal allowance threshold have already borne much of the brunt of the previous government's cost of living crisis and fiscal drag, putting many in a precarious position. What steps is the government taking to ensure that if there is to be further fiscal drag, that these groups are prevented from shouldering further burdens? Thank you. Um, I should have actually welcomed the Honourable uh, Gentleman to his place as well. It was the previous Government's decision to maintain tax thresholds at their current levels until 2028. We have inherited an extremely difficult fiscal situation, meaning we cannot undo everything they did. But the Prime Minister has been clear those with the broader shoulders should bear the heavier burden. The Government is providing half a billion pounds, including the estimated Barnet consequential, to extend the Household Support Fund in England to another six months to 31 March 2025. This continues to be our aim to support those who are most in need. The Household Support Fund is specifically used by local authorities to help the most vulnerable households cover the cost of essentials such as food, energy and water. Josh Barberinde. Mr Speaker, uh, a source of economic instability uh, for local government are the rising costs of temporary accommodation that are spiralling out of control. And Eastbourne Borough Council leader Stephen Holt, together with 118 other council leaders, cross-party wrote to the last government uh, to ask for urgent support and propose a number of solutions too, but they were completely ignored. Will this Chancellor meet with me and local government leaders, including Eastbournes, to discuss what immediate support she can provide to help us across the country tackle the temporary accommodation crisis? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. And I would say, having served as a local councillor for many years, I very much recognise uh, the problem that he is describing, and I am sorry to hear about the situation. I will refer to his comments um, to the Deputy Prime Minister, who is in charge of housing, and I will make sure that he gets a response, because it sounds like it is a troubling situation, and he should have had a response before. Thank you. Bill Esterson. The Minister referred to the £22 billion black hole in the public finances left by the party opposite, and which they hid from the British public. Doesn't what happened under the last government highlight just how important it is to ensure transparency and independent analysis in economic decisions? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. Upon taking office, we discovered, as he said, a £22 billion black hole in the public finances that had been left by the previous government. And we have now uncovered a litany of unfunded spending commitments by the Conservatives. And we recently learned that the deficit is now £4.7 billion higher than the OBR forecast back in March because of their economic recklessness. Yeah. But we will rectify this and we will, spend, we will set out a clear spending plan and our ambitious plan to get the country back into stable economic conditions at the budget. Sir Julian Lewis. Given that the House of Commons Library estimates that the COVID disaster cost the country between 315 and 415 billion pounds can the minister explain how it is that even her own questionable figure of a 22 billion pound black hole isn't a great deal higher <laughs> I think I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question, but could I point out gently to the gentleman that had our economy grown at the average rate of other OECD economies over the last 13 years, it would have been £140 billion larger. Could I also point out to the Conservatives that they've, the tax burden rose to its highest level for 70 years? So I will not be taking
taking any lessons from the party opposite because the last government oversaw the biggest drop in household real disposable incomes since records began. Helen Morgan. Number five, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, with permission, I will answer this question together with questions 10 and 12. Uh, this government supports the triple lock. And as a result, the new state pension is worth £900 more than it was this time last year. And in April, the state pension will go up again by the highest of inflation, average wage growth, or 2.5%. Our commitment to the triple lock is not just for one year, but is for the duration of this Parliament. In addition, pensioners will continue to benefit from free eye tests, free prescriptions and free bus passes and those pensioners most in need will continue to receive winter fuel payments alongside the pension credit. Ella Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Chancellor for her answer, but there are nearly 22,000 pensioners in North Shropshire who are forecast to lose their winter fuel payment uh, very soon. And this, just as energy prices are about to go up by 10% for an average household, Many of my pensioners live in bungalows, they live in older housing stock, which is expensive to heat, and a lot of them have been in touch with me to say that they are worried sick about this winter. We know the Chancellor has difficult choices to make, and we accept that, but will she consider that the broadest shoulders are not those of these pensioners who are earning less than minimum, minimum wage and are about to lose this vital support? I understand the concerns that the uh, Honourable Lady uh, sets out. The state pension is worth £900 more than it was a year ago, and energy bills are lower this winter than they were last winter. As the Honourable Lady points out, we inherited a £22 billion black hole from the previous government, who had made unfunded spending commitments with no idea of how to pay for them. When I became Chancellor, I undertook an immediate audit of the spending situation to understand the scale of that challenge. And I made difficult decisions, some very difficult decisions, to put the public finances on a sustainable footing. They were tough decisions, but they were the right decisions in the circumstances that we face. This includes the decision to make the winter fuel payment better targeted so pensioners who need it most still get it alongside the pension credit. Targeting winter fuel payments saves around £1.5 billion a year to support the public finances. Steve Dahl. Mr Speaker, in Torbay, the constituency I represent, there are 21,000 pensioners who will be impacted by this cut. In Devon and Cornwall, almost 90% of pensioners will be impacted by this cut, whilst many of us would acknowledge that you were left with a massive financial challenge when coming into this post. Those one remains extremely concerned for residents who have reached out to myself and many colleagues with their major concerns about being able to make ends meet as we enter into the winter period. They have had no time to save for this and therefore it is a complete shock to them. What assurances can you give us that you will be supporting those who are most vulnerable and if it is failing to achieve this, what assurances can you give that you will scrap these proposals? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for that question and welcome him to his place. He will be a powerful representative for the people of Torbay. Uh, like the Honourable Gentleman, I, I want to ensure that the lowest income pensioners get the support that they are entitled to. Under the previous government, 800,000 pensioner households entitled to pension credit were not receiving it. That is why this government is currently undertaking action to encourage uptake of the pension credit to ensure that the poorest pensioners those who are not even receiving that minimum income guarantee are getting it. And we're working with organisations like Age UK and local authorities, and all local authorities, including in Torbay, have been written to about how they can play their part in identifying those pensioners who are entitled to pension credit but aren't getting it. The DWP will also bring together the administration of pension credit and housing benefit so that pensioner households currently receiving housing benefit also receive any pension credit that they are entitled to, something that the previous government deferred for years despite knowing that the poorest pensioners were missing out. Caroline Bowden. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Chancellor's announcement of cuts to the winter fuel payment was quickly followed by news of a 10 per cent increase in the energy price cap. South Devon has a higher than average number of pensioners and many of those, particularly living in rural areas, are living in fuel poverty. My, many of my constituencies are struggling to meet the costs of heating but don't quite qualify for pension credit. 
They and thousands of vulnerable people across the country are now deeply anxious about what this winter has in store for them. So will the Chancellor take this opportunity to spell out exactly how she plans to tackle fuel poverty among the elderly? I welcome the Honourable Lady to her place. Uh, pensioners uh, in South Devon, like pensioners in all our constituencies, will be receiving a, a, a basic state pension that is worth £900 more than it was a year ago, and energy prices are lower this winter than they were last winter. There will be many constituents in South Devon who are entitled to the pension credit, but because of the failure to act by the last government, aren't currently receiving it. Uh, we all need to play our part in ensuring that everybody gets the help that they are entitled to, and we should all ensure that our poorest pensioners get that support with both pension credit and the winter fuel payments that are associated with it. Sam Rushworth. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. The village of Copley in my constituency is the snowiest in England, and we have many pensioners in receipt of the basic state pension who are nonetheless in fuel poverty. Uh, they're not entitled to pension credit. Uh, they live in cold, stone-built houses. What um, assurance can the uh, Chancellor give to those pensioners that this government will help to warm their homes and ensure that they do not struggle to heat their homes this winter? This government have committed to insulate an additional five million homes during the course of this Parliament to ensure that energy bills are as low as they possibly can be, saving people money and ensuring their homes are warmer. That will help his constituents in Copley and constituents all across the country. Peter Swallow. The House, uh, the damage to pensioners' livelihoods from the last government's economic incompetence and their decision to cover up the £22 billion black hole in public finances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right to uh, uh, remind us of the dire inheritance that this government has faced. Uh, spending commitment after spending commitment, absolutely no idea of how to pay for it. From road and rail projects to A-levels uh, to the Rwanda deal, £22 billion of unfunded commitments that the last government had no idea how to, play, to pay for. We will fix the foundations of this economy, rebuild Britain and ensure working people are better off fixing the mess that the last government left. Yeah. Jim Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can the Chancellor confirm that a state pension increase will be announced at the Budget and that it will be equivalent to wage growth, inflation or 2.5%, whichever is higher? This government have committed to the triple lock, not just for this year, but the, for the duration of this Parliament. That means that pensioners uh, are £900 better off than they were a year ago. And based on September earnings data and inflation data, we will uprate pensions next year in, um, uh, uh, by whichever is higher, 2.5% inflation or average earnings. We are ensuring that pensioners get the pensions that they are entitled to and have contributed to. Shadow yeah. Minister Laura Trott. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, ten years ago the now Chancellor argued in this House that winter fuel payments should be means tested exactly. and ah. cut yeah. for, and I quote, the richest pensioners. The Chancellor's ten year campaign has now come to fruition. And she's proposed removing winter fuel payments from pensioners on just £13,000 a year. Can I ask the Chancellor, does she still think that a pensioner on £13,000 a year is rich? What has come to an end in July is 14 years of Conservative government that presided over a fall in living standards, the highest tax burden in 70 years, and a um, debt as a share of our economy of almost 100 per cent, and a £22 billion black hole in the public finances just this year. And what we haven't heard from the front bench opposite, or indeed any Conservative member of a parliament, is an apology for the mess that they have left this country in. That this government is now picking up. Dr Danny, Danny Chambers. <coughs> Num number six, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the Honourable Member to his place. 
Since taking office, the Government has set up the Clean Energy Mission Board to enable progress towards the 2030 target. This will accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels to clean, homegrown power, and it will boost Britain's energy independence and security. The Government will also set up a new publicly owned energy company, Great British Energy, which will save families money by ensuring electricity bills are no longer exposed to gas price shocks, and a warm homes plan will improve energy efficiency in homes and cut bills. Sir Danny Chen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, over the last few weeks, I have been absolutely inundated by questions from people of Winchester about the cuts of the winter fuel allowance, and it seems as though people on all sides of the House are getting similar correspondence. Now, while I totally understand that there are many wealthy pensioners who do not rely on the winter fuel allowance to heat their homes, there are a large proportion of pensioners who live on or near the poverty line, and they are going to be plunged into crisis this winter. Given that this is a, a huge strength of feeling on all sides of the House, would the Chancellor reconsider this decision? And if not, would we at least commit to a, a, a vote and a debate in the House about how we best protect our most... I think the Minister... Sorry, sorry. I've got to get through an order paper as well. Put him through the German debate. Minister, I think you've got the... <laughs> Uh, well, I thank the Honourable Member for his comment, uh, but as my right honourable friend the Chancellor set out, uh, pensions, the state pension is £900 more this year than it was last year thanks to the triple lock, and we have committed to maintaining the triple lock as the foundation of state support uh, for pensioners throughout the rest of this Parliament. Energy bills are lower this year, and what is crucial for him and other members around this House is to support our goals to increase the take-up of pension credit, making sure that all of those pensioners who are eligible for pension credit take it up, thereby receiving other benefits, including now the winter fuel payment to which they are entitled. Right. Let us come to Shadow Minister Gareth Davis. Yeah. Mr Speaker, during the general election, the Labour Party committed to bringing down energy bills by £300. Now the election is over, energy bills are going up by some 10%. So on behalf of the British electorate, and especially the 10 million pensioners who are having their winter fuel payments taken away, can the Minister confirm to the House that this £300 cut is still their policy? If it is, how is the £300 specifically calculated, and when will it be delivered? Uh, well, I thank the Shadow Minister for his comment and welcome him to, him to his uh, new place uh, there. Um, he, he referred to the cost of energy, um, and as we know, the cost of energy this year is substantially lower than it was this time last year. Uh, but we are under no illusions about how much more we need to do to make sure that energy bills are truly affordable and we tackle the cost of living crisis. And that is why we have set to work straight away in establishing Great British Energy alongside our National Wealth Fund, which will help invest in those clean energy sources of the future and bring down energy bills for good. The Den spokesperson, Sir Olney. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know the government have inherited a mess. We know that the centre of that mess is a £22 billion hole left in the public finances by the previous government, but that cannot be allowed to cover for measures that cause suffering for the most vulnerable in our society. She will have heard colleagues uh, on the Lib Dem benches talk about the hardship that the scrapping of the winter fuel allowance is going to have on their constituents. So can the Chancellor assure us that she will give her full support to measures to boost the uptake of pension credit? And most crucially, will she give this House the opportunity to have a proper debate and a vote on this cut that will have such an impact on so many? Thank you. Uh, well, I thank the uh, Liberal Democrat spokesperson for her comments um, and for recognising the state of the finances uh, that we inherited, the £22 billion in-year black hole uh, that we need to urgently address to put our, our finances on a firm footing. Um, I think it's absolutely essential to boost the uptake of pension credit, as my right honourable friend the Chancellor set out. 800,000 pensioners who are eligible for pension credit are not currently taking it up. We saw a lack of action under the previous government to drive up that uptake, and we are overseeing a campaign across government uh, to increase the number of pensioners who are accessing pension credit and thereby winter fuel payments. Sarah Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I welcome that response. Um, but uh, if the government are asking us all to make difficult sacrifices, then people need to know that, they're all, that the government are making the vital investments that will protect the vulnerable and help to deliver economic growth. So will the Chancellor agree with me that now is the time to work across government to launch an emergency home energy upgrade programme to provide free insulation and heat pumps for low-income households? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, a crucial part of our manifesto and the manifesto commitments that we brought into government is to increase insulation of up to five million homes um, across this country. Uh, we'll be setting out further details about our plans for insulation in due course, but we know that that is the kind of investment which brings down energy bills for good. Bruce Webb. Question seven, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, uh, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to take this question with numbers 15 and 17. Mr Speaker, the Government is focused on improving living standards across this country, which is why growth is a key priority. If real household disposable income per capita had grown from 2010 to 2023 at the same rate as in 1997 to 2010, it would have been £4,000 higher last year. The approach of this Government would also centre on fostering good work. The Government will reform employment support to offer more people dignity and purpose in meaningful employment. The plan to make work pay sets out a significant and ambitious agenda to ensure workplace rights are fit for the modern economy, empower working people and deliver economic growth. We have launched a ministerial task force on child poverty and updated the Low Pay Commission's remit to consider the cost of living when making recommendations on the national living wage. I thank the Minister for that reply. Many of my constituents here at Blackpool South have contacted me regarding the means testing of the winter fuel allowance and linking to pension credit. It's believed thousands in my constituency don't receive pension credit, potentially missing out on £3,900 a year. What steps is this government taking to ensure that all pensioners in my constituency and across the country receive what they're entitled for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend for his question and welcome him. Uh, to his place, and he is absolutely right to highlight how important it is to make sure that all of those eligible for pension credit, uh, but not claiming it, uh, do sign up and thereby receive the benefits to which they are entitled, including now the winter fuel payment. The Government is undertaking a new campaign to drive take-up, and the Department for Work and Pensions is holding a Pension Credit Week of Action in the first week of September, where promotional activities will be supported by organisations including Age UK and local authorities. There will be further action in the coming months, including TV, press and radio, and we will be directly writing to up to 120,000 pensioners who receive housing benefit but are not claiming pension credit to encourage a claim where they may be eligible. Dan Tomlinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The economic chaos of previous Conservative governments pushed up interest rates, causing mortgage costs to rise by £500 a month for families in Barnet. What steps is the Chancellor taking to bring down rates so that families who've worked hard and saved hard can get the living standards boost that they so desperately need? Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend for his question and welcome him to his place. And as he rightly points out, it is the recklessness of the previous government which has had a direct impact on his constituents' uh, living standards. As a new government, we recognise that many households right across the country have been facing higher mortgage costs in recent years, and we are already taking action to fix Britain's economic foundations with a new approach to growth, with three pillars of stability, investment and reform. Now, Mr Speaker, sustainable public finances are necessary for economic stability and long-term growth, and the government will therefore set out the difficult decisions needed to secure public finances in the budget on October 30th. Mr Speaker, in North Warwickshire and Bedworth, like my honourable friend, monthly mortgage costs rose by an average of 22 per cent in the year following this Government's disastrous mini-budget. This made life really difficult for hard-working families in my constituency. What steps is the Chancellor taking to ensure that such a devastating situation can never happen again to families in my constituency and across the country? Yeah. Oh, well, I thank my honourable friend for her question and welcome her uh, to her place. And she is, of course, absolutely right to highlight just how much damage the Conservatives' recklessness in 2022 caused families in North Warwickshire and beyond. Conservative ministers' decisions unleashed economic turbulence that pushed up people's mortgages and made people across Britain worse off. Our new government will hardwire budget responsibility into government with our new fiscal lock in the Budget Responsibility Bill. That will make sure the disaster we saw nearly two years ago can never happen again. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the living standards of nearly 50,000 pensioners in Malvern Hills District and Witchhaven District uh, are going to be deteriorating very sharply this winter in the front of 10% increase in their energy bills and no winter 
fuel allowance. Many of these pensioners have incomes just above the pension credit threshold and many of them of course are too frail and too old to work. And yet, within the first few days of coming to office, the Chancellor managed to spend over £22 billion very quickly by setting up Great British Energy, by setting up a national wealth, wealth fund, and by giving in to the pay demands of her party's union, Paymasters. Is it not the case that this Chancellor has made the chilling political choice to balance the books of this country on the very frailest shoulders? Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I'm disappointed uh, that the Honourable Member uh, is talking down essential investments um, in our country's future that we've made, um, and that she also seems to be confused that there is a £22 billion black hole because of the unfunded spending commitments made by the party opposite uh, when they were in government. Um, but she makes an important point about protecting pensioners, and that is why it is so important to ensure that all of those pensioners who are eligible for pension credit take up pension credit, and I would look forward to her support in making sure they do so. Wendy Chamberlain. Mr. Speaker, statistics from the Trussell Trust published today show that people on universal credit, half of them ran out of money and couldn't afford to buy food before the end of the month. What prospect do these people have to increase their living standards? Now, the reintroduction of the Household Support Fund is welcome, but can I ask the Treasury what steps are they doing to make sure that people do not go hungry this winter? I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question. As she, as she rightly points out, through the extension of the Household Support Fund, the Government is providing £500 million uh, to extend this fund in England for another uh, six months, and it would include Barnet uh, Consequentials. Uh, we believe that is an important uh, measure to help people uh, with the months ahead. Uh, but I think in the longer term, the crucial way to get people's living standards to increase and to tackle the cost of living crisis is to get the economy growing. And we've spoken at length about the measures that we've already taken as a new government, from planning reform to the National Wealth Fund to Great British Energy. All of that is about getting the economy growing, because that is the way to sustainably make people better off and invest in our public services. Kirsty Blackman. Thank you. Testing the winter fuel payment increases the burden on many vulnerable people, and it reduces their living standards. Unlike the Scottish Government, who's, who have got many con statutory constraints on our budgets, the Chancellor's fiscal rules are entirely self-imposed. Does the Minister think that sticking to the Chancellor's fiscal rules is more important than the health and well-being of pensioners? Well, I thank the Honourable Member for her question, um, but I think, you know, let me be really clear about this. If we don't have fiscal responsibility, if we don't stick to fiscal rules, then we lack the economic stability, which is so crucial to getting the economy growing um, and to making sure that people across Britain are better off. We have to make sure that we return stability and fiscal responsibility to our country after the record of the government um, opposite. We saw what happened when the government opposite lost control of public finances when they made unfunded spending commitments. We need to make sure that will never happen again, which is why we are hardwiring fiscal responsibility into the future of government through our new budget responsibility bill. Damien Egan. Question number nine, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will answer this question together with question 22. Sustained economic growth is the only route to improving the prosperity of our country and living standards of working people. That is why we have already taken a number of actions to begin to deliver on our growth mission, the number one priority of this new Labour government, with a series of planning reforms to get Britain building, establishing a national wealth fund to, co uh, to bring in private sector investment, announcing a pensions review to unlock growth, boost investment and deliver better returns for pensioners, and launching Skills England, and announcing the forthcoming white paper on getting Britain working again. This government is determined to boost growth and improve living standards, and by doing that, to have the money that we need to fund our vital public services. Damien Negan. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Chancellor for her answer, and so much of what she describes um, and talks about um, the delivery of that runs through local government. I'd like to ask the Chancellor about the progress that has been made to giving local councils longer-term funding settlements. Yeah. 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 
My honourable friend is absolutely right to make this point. The government is committed to delivering longer term certainty for local authorities. This is part of our wider commitment to a more empowered, accountable, and sustainable local government system, which will support strong public services in all of our communities. The government will set out further details on its plans for local government funding through the upcoming budget and spending review on 30 October. Catherine Fuchs. Speaker, this year alone we have had two more high street banking branches close in Monmouthshire, bringing the total to eight in the last two years. My constituents now find themselves struggling to access basic banking services, particularly in Caldicott. Recently I was handed a petition signed by over 3,500 constituents and I'm sure the Chancellor will understand the importance of high street banking not only to our constituents but to local businesses and local economic growth. What progress has the Chancellor made in her work with colleagues in the Welsh Government to support high street banks and hubs in Monmouthshire and across Wales? Uh, I welcome my honourable friend uh, to her place, and it's already obvious that she's going to be a, a strong voice for the people of Monmouthshire. In our party manifesto, we committed to roll out 350 banking hubs in communities like the ones that she speaks about that have lost multiple banks in the last few years. My um, honourable friend, the Economic Secretary, will happily meet, meet uh, with my uh, uh, honourable friend to, uh, to work on how we can achieve one of those banking hubs in her constituency and that is an offer right across the House. So many of our constituencies have lost bank branches in the last few years. For older people, for small businesses, for families, this can be devastating, the lack of access to cash, and we're determined to reverse that with the rollout of these new banking hubs. Growth and additional runway capacity at Gatwick, Mr Speaker, is again uh, on the agenda. My constituents who work there and those that fly from there benefit from its stability and reach. The careful balance between additional homes and jobs any expansion to flights brings uh, needs to be recognised. Can the Chancellor confirm that suitable growth will not come on the backs of communities like mine without proper consultation and acknowledgement of impact. Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for that question. Um, this Government was pleased to sign off uh, the expansion of London City Airport because we recognise how important uh, aviation uh, is to our economy uh, to get growth and investment into the UK. Of course it's right that we always take into account uh, local views and uh, make sure that any uh, investment or any uh, expansion of airports uh, comes with it the infrastructure that is needed for local communities. But the answer to decisions, whether it is on road or rail or energy or aviation, can't always be no. Because if the answer is always no, we will continue with the situation we've faced the last 14 years of low growth, deteriorating living standards and worsening public infrastructure. We cannot continue like that. Who put low? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I, I've got a question for the Chancellor, which is I, I see that the taxpayer... The taxpayer is now accountable to the state. The state is not accountable to the taxpayer. And I think a lot of the root causes of our growth come from the fact that many of our offices run by the state are not working and they're actually strangling our economy. And I'd like to know what the Chancellor is going to do to ensure that government is as accountable to the taxpayer as the taxpayer is to government. Well, that is the purpose of elections, uh, and at the last election, this government achieved uh, a sizeable majority for our missions, including to grow the economy, to improve living standards and make working people better off. We've just got started, and that is what we are absolutely determined to do, to deliver on the mandate that we got on the 4th of July. Shadow Minister Alan Mack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The IOD's latest Economic Confidence Index shows optimism in the economy fell back to minus 12 last month following a three-year high of plus seven in July. Can the Chancellor explain how Labour's tax rises on working people, businesses and pensioners will contribute to economic growth when the economy is already going backwards under this Labour government? 
Uh, well, I, I think I thank the honourable gentleman uh, for that question. On the 14th of October, we are hosting an international investment summit, uh, welcoming to London some of the biggest investors in the world. In the last two months that I've been in this role, I've met over 300 business leaders, uh, talking to them about the huge opportunities to invest in our great country, in industries like life sciences, financial services, creative industries, low carbon technologies. The opportunities are endless, and this government is determined to work with business to ensure that we bring good jobs, investment and prosperity right across the United Kingdom. And now come to topicals, Gagan Mahendra. Topical number one, Mr Speaker, please. Mr Speaker, this government has inherited a £22 billion black hole in the public finances. That requires tough choices to rectify the situation that we have inherited. And we will also clamp down on egregious spending and half government spending on consultancy. This will save £500 million next year. Increasing consultancy spend has been rife across government these last four years, up 55% at the Department for Transport up 137% at the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, and up a staggering 416% at the Home Office. No wonder taxes are so high and public services are so poor when the last government frittered away taxpayers' money with no concern. I will treat taxpayers' money with respect. We will fix the foundations of our economy so we can rebuild Britain and make working people better off. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the Chancellor to her place? Uh, Notwithstanding what she's just said there, can the Chancellor tell the House why she has made the political decision to scrap the commitment to at least 2.5% of GDP on defence spending, undermining our support for Ukraine, and instead prioritised giving her union paymasters inflation-busting pay rises that have only led to more unions calling for more strikes and more pay? Let me respond directly on the issue of Ukraine. I had the pleasure to meet Minister Marchenko from Ukraine in my first couple of weeks in this job and made the commitment to him to go ahead with the Extraordinary Revenue Acceleration Programme. I think this is an area that it's important that across the House we work together to support the Ukrainian people uh, against the Russian invasion. In the last Parliament, we always supported the government when they took action to support the Ukrainian people. I hope that that cross-party support can continue. Everybody, it's top it and I've got a big list to get through. Rachel Maskell will give us a good example. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In York, the average rent rise of 11.9% exceeded the state pension rise by £380 this year, with the loss of the cost of living payments and winter fuel payments, increasing the energy price cap and cost of living. Pensioners are frightened how they're going to keep warm this winter, as am I. With changing the eligibility for the winter fuel payments, how will she protect pensioners above the pension credit threshold to prevent cold, ill health or worse this winter? Uh, I thank my honourable friend for that question. The basic state pension is worth £900 more than it was a year ago and will go up again in uh, April next year uh, because of the triple lock which we have committed to for the duration of this Parliament. We have already written to York Council and working with local authorities across the country to boost take-up of pension credit because this Government, unlike the last Government, is determined to ensure that 800,000 people entitled to pension credit actually receive it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When the Chancellor was sitting on this side of the House, she repeatedly attacked cronyism. So can she tell the House whether she told the Treasury Permanent Secretary that Ian Caulfield had made a donation to her before she got him appointed as a Director in the Treasury, yes or no? All governments appoint people to the civil service. Uh, The donation from Ian Caulfield was declared over a year ago in the proper way, and we answered all the questions in the right way uh, that the civil service asked uh, when we made that appointment. Uh, Ian Caulfield is supporting this government in hosting the International Investment Summit, which is going to bring hundreds of global investors to the UK next month. I think that means the answer is no. And the Ministerial Code states that Ministers must ensure that no conflict arises or could reasonably be perceived to arise between their public duties and their private interests, financial or otherwise. That did not happen. So will she tell the House why is cronyism wrong under the Conservatives but acceptable under Labour? 
I think they've got a bit of brass neck uh, criticising uh, this government after the appointments and the partying at Downing Street that we saw under the last Conservative government and billions of pounds of contracts handed out to friends and donors of the Conservative Party. That's why this government are appointing a Covid corruption commissioner to get that money back from taxpayers, because unlike the last government, we are determined that taxpayers' money is treated with respect and not handed out to donors of the party. Speaker, Age UK report that there are around one million pensioners who just miss out on the winter fuel payment. These are people living on modest incomes within £50 of the poverty line who will miss out due to a tiny occupational pension, including many in Liverpool Wavertree. We have heard about the uh, campaign to take up pension credits, but can my right hon. Friend tell us specifically whether that pension credit will be backdated? Uh, yes, absolutely. Pension credit can be up, uh, backdated by um, up to three months, and we will ensure that happens. We are also working closely with Liverpool City Council to ensure that uh, constituents in Liverpool, Wavertree, and indeed in all of our constituencies, are getting the support that they are entitled to. The poorest pensioners who are entitled to pension credit should get it. It's a travesty that 800,000 missed out under the last Conservative government. We will ensure that pensioners entitled to support get it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's estimated the Bank of England will require a further £110 billion of taxpayer subsidy to cover long bond sale losses through to 2030. So why is the Chancellor clobbering pensioners to save £1.5 billion a year when she could be challenging the Bank of England to save tens of billions of pounds a year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, before I became a Member of Parliament, I was an economist at the Bank of England, and I respect the independence of the Bank of England. The previous government undermined that independence. Uh, that cause uh, contributed to the economic chaos we saw under the last Conservative government. This government will never go down that route. Chris MacDonald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Chancellor of the Exchequer confirm that her decisions are targeted at winning new investment in green industry in places such as Billingham, in my constituency? I thank my uh, honourable friend for that question, um, and I also welcome him to this House because he brings a great deal of expertise on green steel uh, from his previous career. And indeed, um, part of the plans of this government is to launch the National Wealth Fund is precisely to create investment across the country in some very important strategic industries, and decarbonisation of steel uh, and the steel industry is one of those. Luca Harding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the prospect of the financial collapse of a major utility company like Thames Water should cause us all grave concern. Not only what it would mean for consumers in my constituency and many like it, but the wider implications it will carry for our economy and the government finances. Would the Chancellor therefore agree with me that putting Thames Water into special administration now? and reforming it would not just protect consumers, including my constituents, but would protect the wider economy. Water companies are commercial entities. It would therefore not be appropriate for me to comment on it today, and it is for the company and its investors to resolve their possible issues. Josh Dubre. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For decades, members of the Mine Workers' Pension Scheme in Cannock Chase and across the country have seen billions go to successive governments. With an average of 19 scheme members passing away every day, the resolution cannot come too soon. So can I ask the Treasury what progress has been made on transferring the government's share of the MPS investment reserve to scheme members? Uh, this was an issue that I championed in the last Parliament as Chair of the Committee, and I am pleased to confirm that I am working with colleagues across government to make progress and will update the House further in due course. Lisa Smart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Stories of crumbling public infrastructure are all too common. Stepping Hill Hospital in Hazel Grove has had to close buildings because the condition was no longer deemed safe, and we've seen footage of medics having to wade through flooded corridors when pipes have burst. The allocated capital money simply cannot cover the repairs backlog. How will the Chancellor ensure that hospitals like Stepping Hill can access the capital investment they need, both to repair crumbling buildings and to deliver additional sites where needed? Uh, the Government is reviewing the new hospitals programme as part of our spending review. Uh, we will undertake a full and comprehensive review whilst continuing to deliver the most advanced and most urgent hospitals in a realistic time frame. Ruth Cabre. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The letter from the Cabinet Secretary to the former Chancellor that emerged this morning clearly stated 
that the failure by the last government holding a spending review following the unexpected national and global pressures significantly contributed to the fiscal challenge that the Labour government inherited. What can the Chancellor learn from this? I thank my honourable friend for that question. The party opposite crashed the economy and then wrecked the public finances, leaving us with a £22 billion black hole in the public finances. The Shadow Chancellor isn't willing to be straight about the damage that he did and is now trying to pass the buck to independent civil servants. I will always be honest about the public finances and take the tough decisions that we need to fix the foundations of our economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in July, borrowing stood at £3.1 billion, um, well ahead of the OPR's forecast of £0.1 billion. Does the Chancellor agree that she could have actually reduced the level of the national debt had she chosen not to reward her trade union paymasters by spending £10 billion in inflation busting pay rises? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, the, the government borrowing is running at £4.7 billion higher than the OBR forecast because the previous government made unfunded commitments without any idea of how they were going to be paid for. The previous government set the mandate for the independent pay review bodies, and we have honoured the recommendations of the independent pay review bodies to ensure that our armed forces, our police officers, and our nurses and our teachers got a pay rise. I think that is the right thing to do. If he doesn't, I don't wonder how he justifies that to public sector workers in his constituency. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Minister share my concerns about reports of the trade union victimisation at the HMRC's Benton Park View Office in Newcastle, where three PCS reps have already been dismissed and more face live disciplinary proceedings? I'm pleased to welcome those three reps to Parliament today. Will the Minister agree to meet with them and the PCS about this worrying situation? I thank my honourable friend for her question. And as government ministers, we greatly value and respect trade unions and the work of trade union representatives in supporting their members. Whilst it's not appropriate for me to comment on individual cases, I will look into this matter further and respond to my honourable friend in due course. So, Ashley Fox. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the Chancellor's decision to cut the winter fuel payment is forecast to save £1.5 billion. Can she advise the House what other options she considered? for making savings in the DWP budget before deciding to make this cut? Uh, I thank the hon. Gentleman for his question. The black hole that we inherited was £22 billion, and we announced in the statement on July 29 £5.5 billion worth of savings to uh, reduce the size of that black hole. But the hon. Gentleman can see that there is still work to be done, and we will be setting out further measures in the budget on 30 October to get a grip of the public finances. Joe Powell. Mr Speaker, a forthcoming Transparency International report has identified 28 contracts worth £4.1 billion that were awarded to parties with direct political connections to the party opposite. So, Can she update us on the progress of appointing the Covid Corruption Commissioner and whether they will take evidence from corruption campaigners like Transparency International? Uh, we are appointing a fixed-term COVID fraud commissioner through an open competition that is now running as of this morning. Uh, the commissioner will make sure that everything is done to return money owed to the taxpayer. It will report to the Chancellor, working with the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, and will report to Parliament in due course. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The uh, economic potential of the Brigham Nimmingham uh, constituency in the wider Humber region is heavily dependent on the renewable energy sector. However, there is a cloud on the horizon with the uh, 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 future of Scunthorpe Steelworks in doubt. Can the Chancellor give an assurance that if uh, there are redundancies at, at Scunthorpe, there will be a general, uh, generous package of support for workers and inv uh, investment through the local authority uh, to re redevelop the uh, area? Uh, the Honourable Gentleman speaks powerfully about the huge opportunities at, at Immingham and on the whole East Coast in terms of renewable energy, as well as in carbon capture and storage. Part of the National Wealth Fund is to invest in industries like carbon capture and storage, but also in our crucial steel sector, which is important to so many of the other government uh, ambitions about growing our economy. We are determined to support the steel sector uh, through that investment with the National Wealth Fund. Jane Kirkham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Chancellor's plans for growth are welcome to Cornwall. In the meantime, we are relying upon shared prosperity funds and town steel money. The deadlines for completion of those schemes are March 25 and March 26. To ensure that that investment is not lost, will the Chancellor 
consider extending the deadlines for completion of those schemes for up to 12 months. <laughs> um, I thank my honourable friend uh, for that question and welcome her to uh, her place. And she speaks powerfully on behalf of the people um, of Cornwall too. Um, the spending review will be the appropriate time uh, to look at the shared prosperity funds and what uh, resource we can give to the people of Cornwall. And I'm sure that uh, my honourable friend will work with the relevant secretaries of state uh, to ensure uh, that those representations are heard. Dave Doolan. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor would have known in advance of the cut to winter fuel payment and stripping £160 million from pensioners in Scotland that Scottish pensioners suffer the lowest temperatures. Rural Scottish pensioners live in some of the oldest houses on these islands, and most Scottish pensioners in rural areas are off the gas grid. So, knowing that, can she tell us what discussions did she have with her 37 new Scottish Labour MPs about pushing Scottish pensioners into fuel poverty? Well, I would just note that the Scottish Government have decided to mirror what the wider UK Government is doing, rather than using the tax uh, powers that the Scottish Government uh, have. That is the decision that the Scottish Government have made, given the fiscal situation that they face. We face a similar issue with a £22 billion black hole in the public finances. Sean Davis. Um, I welcome the plans of this Government to get Britain building again, with a commitment to build one and a half million homes across our country. There is also a million homes that councils have given planning consent to. Those with a skin in the game need help and support to get those houses unblocked. What um, steps will the Government uh, make in that regard? Um, I thank my honourable friend for that question and, and welcome him to his place. As a former local government leader, uh, he knows the huge opportunities that there are uh, to build the homes that our country desperately needs. We have made a commitment to build one and a half million homes during the duration of this parliament. That will uh, require uh, making decisions to call in planning decisions, as we already have done in the first week in office with four specific housing developments. Thousands of pensioners in my Aldridge Brown Hills constituency have worked hard all their lives and now worried at the prospect of losing their winter fuel payment upon which they rely. Will the Right Honourable Lady reconsider and reverse her decision? Well, the increases in the basic state pension mean that constituents uh, of hers are £900 better off than they were a year ago, and of course energy bills are lower this year than they were uh, last year. But it is important that we ensure that the 800,000 people who missed out on pension credit under the previous Conservative government now get access to that support, because those are the poorest pensioners, and at the moment they are living in poverty because the previous government failed to sign them up to pension credit. Okay. Emily Darlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Chancellor and her team whether, as departments are preparing their spending review submissions, whether she would consider allowing the international development budget to be on the same footing as the R&D budget and look at it over 10 years so we can get back to that 0.7, and whether she would be willing to meet with me and a delegation to discuss the benefits of such an approach to such an important budget. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the government spending review is currently underway. All decisions on ODA spending will be taken in the round as part of that process, and I'd be delighted to meet with my honourable friend and her colleagues to discuss this very issue. Right, we'll let the front benches change over. All the best. Right, we now come to the urgent question. Dame Harriet Bowen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To ask the Foreign Secretary if he will make a statement on the political and humanitarian situation in Sudan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like first to welcome the Right Honourable Lady to her place. Of course, as former African Minister, I know that she's deeply concerned about these issues and very grateful uh, for the fact that this urgent question has been brought. It could not be, indeed, more urgent. Last month, Mr. Speaker, I visited South Sudan to assess the situation in Sudan and to meet those who have been forced to flee horrendous violence. 
the scenes of suffering and devastation that I heard about from families that have been torn apart, children who were on the brink of starvation, have been etched in my memory. We now have confirmation that the senseless war between the Sudanese Armed Forces, or SAF, SAF, and the Rapid Support Forces has brought famine to Sudan. In northern Darfur's Zamzam IDP camp, which hosts over half a million people, 100 people are dying from starvation every day. But we have to be clear that these conditions exist across Sudan. We should be discussing a more damning assessment today, but a sustained tactic of denying access to the hardest hit areas of the country is making many people and their suffering invisible. The famine facing Sudan is almost entirely man-made and a direct consequence of the deliberate efforts by both warring parties to block aid getting to those most in need. The warring parties must remember their obligations under international humanitarian law. Access must not be arbitrarily denied and starvation must not be used as a weapon of war. The UK welcomes the decision to reopen the Adre border crossing for humanitarian assistance for three months. This move, if conducted in good faith, could save thousands of lives. The SAF must act to remove any unnecessary restrictions on trucks moving through Adre, and the RSF must urgently facilitate movement into areas under their control. Without this, life-saving aid will be blocked from access, uh, accessing those most in need. Now, last month, I announced an additional £15 million of vital assistance to Sudan, South Sudan and Chad to support vulnerable people forced to flee violence and seek safety. With this announcement, the UK has almost doubled its order to Sudan to £97 million this financial year, most of which is vital humanitarian aid. The UK has also welcomed efforts by the US, Saudi Arabia and Switzerland to bring the warring parties to the negotiating table last month. But we remain deeply concerned that the SAF did not take the opportunity to act in the best interests of the people they claim to represent, refusing to attend the talks in person. The warring parties must do everything in their power to ensure that this wholly unjustified war must end immediately. We also continue to call upon the RSF to implement the commitments made in the Jeddah Declaration to protect civilians. We stand ready to support partners in following up on these talks, including using the UK's role as penholder on Sudan at the UN Security Council. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, for granting this urgent question. Yesterday, Parliament spent time on two terrible conflicts in Ukraine and in the Middle East, but we must not allow this Parliament to forget about the increasingly dreadful situation uh, in Sudan. And I welcome uh, the Honourable Right Honourable Lady to her position. And I know that she has just come back from visiting South Sudan, and I welcome uh, the focus that she is clearly putting uh, on the situation. Uh, it is an absolutely urgent situation with 10 million people internally displaced, 4 million of them are children, 2 million have fled as refugees and half the country's population of 47 million now needs food aid. Three quarters of a million people are starving in a famine that has only been made worse by this recent uh, flooding. So I want to urge the government to pay uh, really urgent attention to this uh, situation. We cannot lose the momentum and focus uh, on resolving this conflict and on improving access uh, for humanitarian aid. The UK is the penholder at the United Nations and uh, with Norway and the United States we form the Troika which can act as an interlocutor with the warring parties. Uh, what progress is being uh, initiated to follow up on the unsuccessful effort recently uh, last month to uh, try and bring uh, the Sudanese armed forces to the table. Uh, the US Special Envoy uh, Tom Periello has been working very hard on trying to make progress, but what role is the UK government uh, playing? Uh, it's also very welcome that uh, the Adre crossing has opened and that there is now some improvement in um, humanitarian access, but the UK again has a key role to play in bringing other donors together for Sudan. 
And what plans does the UK government have itself to convene uh, other influential regional players like uh, the African Union, uh, like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, where our extensive and excellent diplomatic network can make such an important difference? And overall, what strategy does the UK government have to counteract the growing influence of Russia in the region, where they are fomenting these conflicts, both in Sudan and in nearby countries like Libya, in order to gain access to Red Sea and Mediterranean ports and encourage migration patterns such as uh, those that we have seen? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to the Right Honourable Lady's commitment uh, on these incredibly important questions. Um, she talked about some of the figures around those who have been displaced. Well, indeed, Sudan currently is the world's largest displacement crisis in absolute terms. Um, of course, some of those individuals have been displaced before. I particularly talked when I was in South Sudan to those who had left South Sudan because it had been so unsafe, gone into Sudan and then been forced back into South Sudan once more. So this really is a horrendous crisis and it's one that deserves international focus and that is what we are determined to provide as a new UK government, of course recognising what took place previously under uh, previous government as well. We want to ensure this crisis is given the attention that it deserves. That includes, of course, through being the pen holder, as she rightly noted, uh, at the UN, but also continuously urging those warring parties to come to the table and ensuring that the voices of civil society, of course, are not ignored here. That has been particularly important for the UK to make sure that we are actually convening those civil society actors. I met with some of them myself when I was in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa. Um, clearly, they are not able to operate in Sudan, many of them. It is too dangerous, uh, but they are seeking still to make sure that voice of civil society, including women, is listened to. Um, she talked about applying international pressure uh, to partners. And just very briefly to finish in my response to her, I would say that, of course, is important positively when it comes to the work we can do together. So again, when I was in Addis, I met with the African Union, with Commissioner Bancoli, to talk with him about what we could do together, ensuring that other regional actors are brought in to uh, push forward peace and the ceasefire that's so desperately needed, the humanitarian access that's needed. But of course, there's also that negative issue of the other countries that are becoming involved in this conflict, that are worsening it. And the UK government is absolutely clear. Engagement with the warring parties in any measure that is not focused on humanitarian access or peace, that engagement will only prolong this devastating war, which is leading to so much death and destruction. Dan Carver. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This is one of the world's worst conflicts uh, and humanitarian disasters and sadly receives so little of our attention. I welcome the urgent question uh, and the Minister's statement. Uh, can I praise the efforts of the British Embassy uh, in exile in Addis? Uh, it's clear we need a long-term strategy to contribute to end the fighting and begin a political settlement. And I just wonder uh, what plans the Minister has to send UK personnel back into Sudan uh, when the time is right, perhaps based on the port of Sudan until a return to Khartoum is possible. Minister. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for raising this, and I have to say that the staff uh, from the uh, UK Embassy. Uh, that was previously in Sudan really did show the best of uh, UK government. No question about that. They were placed in a truly horrendous, terrifying situation uh, at the time of the beginning of this conflict, uh, effectively under siege in the middle of uh, the beginning of a dreadful war. Uh, they've shown the best of government, no question about that, and I praise them. I was very pleased to be able to meet with a number of them uh, when I was in Addis Ababa. They're operating, obviously, out of uh, Ethiopia currently because it's too dangerous for them to be operating within Sudan. I know they would be, of course, uh, very keen to ensure that we do have that presence, but of course we also need to ensure uh, safety. And my goodness, that was really tested uh, previously. And again, I praise their bravery in that case. The Liberal Democrat spokesman, Leila Lumran. May I congratulate the Shadow Minister for securing this urgent question, and you, Mr. Speaker, for granting it? Because as we've heard, this could not be more urgent. Over 25 million people are suffering from acute food insecurity. That's more than half of the population. In one South Darfur health facility, five malnourished children were dying every day in July 
this year, and yet the plight as a whole has been largely met by silence from the international community. At the Paris donor meeting in April, the previous government did not commit to any additional humanitarian assistance, but just re-announced a previous commitment. So can the Minister tell the House what extra support the new government will provide from now on? And given that the conference itself only raised half of what is needed, the case for even more additional UK aid is clear. But we also need to play our part in securing a path to peace in Sudan as a whole. And given the UK's role as the penholder at the UN, can the Minister tell me what specific actions are being taken to prevent the supply of arms by neighbouring countries? Given the distressing news that a slave market has opened outside Khartoum, what actions are they taking to prevent humanitarian trafficking through the conflict as well? I'm very grateful to the member for Oxford Western Abingdon for raising these important points. And I would say, first of all, when it comes to UK support in this area, we have doubled the overseas development assistance contribution coming from the UK, recognising the severity of this crisis. Uh, that means that uh, I announced another £15 million uh, pounds of vital assistance on the 22nd of August, bringing that up to £97 million. Uh, obviously focused on Sudan, where it's possible to operate. Of course, much of the country is very, very difficult to access, including for humanitarian bodies now, but also for those fleeing to South Sudan and Chad as well. Um, she talked about neighbouring countries. Um, I would mention uh, the fact that there are a number of countries uh, which we would be uh, uh, very, very clear in urging to not engage in destabilising activity. I know I mentioned this a moment ago in response to the, uh, uh, the, the Shadow Development Minister, but any activity that is not focused on humanitarian uh, support or on promoting peace is effectively prolonging the war, it's worsening the humanitarian situation, and it's creating a legacy for the future, which will be very, very difficult to deal with. We're seeing large numbers of unaccompanied children, for example, uh, uh, a really, really disturbing situation. So we want that message to be heard loud and clear. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I appreciate it. Um, I wish that this conflict and resulting famine wasn't stopped before it started, and I'm grateful for the Secretary of State's commitment to it. However, when the International Development Select Committee took evidence in April, we very much found that it was a war on women. So can the Secretary of State please tell us what specifically she is doing to protect women from the horrendous rapes that are going on, from the sexual abuse, and what she is doing to, for, the, uh, for the Foreign Secretary team to gather atrocity prevention data? Minister. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for mentioning this, and of course she has great expertise in this area, um, and we are deeply concerned about the escalation of conflict-related sexual violence that we've seen taking place in Sudan since the outbreak of the conflict in April 2023. Um, we've, we've seen reports that I know she will be well aware of and others in the House that, uh, for example, uh, there have been 262 rape cases reported over the period from April to August. That is likely to be a massive underestimate of the situation on the ground. Um, disturbingly, we we are seeing those uh, uh, women and girls um, who are subject to sexual violence in IDP camps when they're travelling, at checkpoints, even in their own homes, when they're trying to get firewood, when they're desperately trying to get uh, support for their families. There are also reports of kidnapping, ransom and sexual exploitation. She asked, what is the UK doing on this? We continue to condemn those atrocities against women and girls. We've called out human rights violations, especially conflict-related sexual violence carried out by the parties to the conflict. And we've done that within the UN Human, Human Rights Council and Security Council, and we're working to ensure that evidence is indeed collected. Sir Gavin Williamson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the fighting in Sudan is not just having an impact on that country itself, but also neighbouring countries such as South Sudan, who can't actually export its natural resources. Uh, what action is the government taking to try and see if they can open up channels for countries such as South Sudan to be able to export the goods in order to feed their people in their country as well? Minister. 
Yeah, I am grateful to the right hon. Gentleman for raising this. And, um, of course, he will be aware that there was already a humanitarian crisis in South Sudan. I visited the Benchu refugee camp, which um, houses 100,000 people and effectively a, an island of Maroons people uh, 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 within a kind of lake of flood water at the moment. There was already a crisis there. He is absolutely right that economic prospects have gone even further backwards with the uh, crisis. The main oil pipeline, of course, has been uh, impacted by the, um, uh, by the conflict within Sudan. So we have been having discussions with international partners about what can be done to try and improve that situation. I had discussions, for example, with the World Bank when I was in Juba in South Sudan about what can be done around economic reform. And I would say there is a role for the government of South Sudan in ensuring that economic reform uh, actually takes place. I made that very clear that that reform needs to take place, that we need to see strong action. We also need to see elections. And of course, that impact of the Sudan conflict is being felt, as you said, in South Sudan too. On behalf of the Newport Sudanese community who came together yesterday in Pill to open their new community centre and who I know feel that this conflict and this famine of such epic proportions still goes largely unseen, can I ask the Minister to reiterate again to those who hear such horrific stories <coughs> from family and friends that we will all do all that we can as the pen holder on Sudan at the UN Security Council to ensure that international attention and actions are not too little and too late and that, crucially, aid gets to the right places? Minister. I am grateful to my hon. Friend for raising the important point about diaspora communities within the UK. I also have spoken with many people with Sudanese heritage within the UK who are deeply concerned about the situation at home. There are very, very few people. In fact, I am yet to meet someone who has Sudanese heritage who has not been impacted somehow with a close family member who has not been killed, subject to violence, had to flee, or indeed is in food insecurity. So I pay tribute to the Sudanese community in Newport, across uh, our country, and most certainly their plight is not being forgotten. Sir Julian. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I commend the Minister for having made her visit so promptly? It seems to me that this conflict, judging by the amount of coverage that the conflict in Ukraine and Middle East gets uh, night after night on the news, ought similarly to be constantly featuring in our media. Why is that not happening? Is it purely because of the denial of journalistic access? 